Hi, Stephanie, and welcome to I Don't Care the Podcast. Um, I want you to introduce yourself a little bit as like Stephanie the person, because I'll cover who Stephanie the worker, the producer, the actor, the writer, the pro- like all of that. I'll talk about that. Um, but who is Stephanie? Oh my goodness. That's a big question. Big question. Um, right? I am, I'm from Ottawa, Ontario, Canada, and I moved to the West Coast about 12 years ago. Uh, who am I as a person? I, I'm a big movie nerd. I am a big book nerd. I love to run. I have the cutest cat in the whole world. Uh, in mm-hmm. my um, I live in East Van. I like to go outdoors. I'm very active. Yeah, I don't know. No, that's a great answer. I feel like it's hard to, it's kind of a hard one, a little bit. It is a little bit. Um, of a but, hit. right? We're just, yeah, we're just I feel like, like just, oh, sorry, there's a delay and we're covering over each other. Yeah, I, go ahead. I, I just trying to figure that. No, I was just going to say, yeah, it's not something we usually get asked. I feel like, um, even, coming out of high school and it's like, okay, what job are you going to do? What's, what is it that you're going to be? What do you want to da 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 da? But it's never like, who are you apart from who you want to be? So I thought I'd ask. I think it's an important question to ask because I think, especially if you're in the kind of fast paced industry that I'm in, uh, it's very easy to completely forget and negate who you are and all of a sudden you become mostly just what you do. I have definitely been guilty of that. Yeah, exactly. So I want to know, and this is actually a question from Meg McCarthy. She's an interviewer. So I kind of took it from her because I like it. But um, what is uh, a production or something that made you fall in love with storytelling? Hmm. There's lots. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. I was one of those kids who it would be a sunny, beautiful Saturday afternoon. Everyone would be outside running around, playing games in the yard, and I would be in my dark basement watching uh movies by myself. So mm-hmm. I was really like my my mother was concerned about me at one point because she just she was like what's wrong with my daughter she won't stop watching television but I just I don't know what it was but I just got something really soothing and um I just loved storytelling and I loved getting lost in another world so much so very very young I was obsessed with movies I was obsessed with tv shows like it would it was all I would talk about it was all I would want to um do with my time so I mean when I was really young one of the first ones I, I I remember seeing Girl Interrupted when I was quite young, and it was just the right age for it. Do you know that movie? No, I don't. Oh, you're too young for Girl Interrupted. Um, it was Winona Ryder and um, uh, what's her name? Oh God, I'm gonna um blank on her name. Um, Brad Pitt's ex-wife. Um, Angelina Jolie. I can't believe I forgot her name. Yeah. Um, Angelina and, and Winona. And it was this really gritty, um, sort of a psychological thriller style, but it was based on this book and just really beautifully directed, beautifully acted, um, telling the story about, you know, the film itself is about, um, you know, the repression of, of the female identity in society and also, Um, the acceptance of sort of the flaws within us. And it just sort of hit me right in the the right time. I was an angsty teenager and Mm -hmm. I saw so much of myself in those characters and all of my own sort of like inner turmoil being expressed. And it was just such a a great movie. I remember that film having a really strong impact on me. And then I was a huge X-Files fan. Like I cannot tell you how big of an X-Files fan I was. Um, I used to, you know what I used to do? So way back in the day, you, you will not know this, but way back in the day, we used to get like books with our paper every year that had the schedules for the TV channels every week. Oh, okay. And it was, it was very analog. 
And right. there were little write-ups that went with every episode. Like it would be like X-Files episode 307. Uh, when the mm -hmm. monster from this uh, swamp takes over Southern Seattle or something like that, there would be a little write-up. I used to right. go through and cut those out, the X-Files, and I kept them in a scrapbook. Wow. So wow. You know, I love that, though, because it, it would keep you organized. Like, today, if you want to watch something on cable and you don't know when it's playing, you either have to search it or you have to scroll through the time. So, honestly, that, like, keeps you organized on your TV schedule, yeah. which I love. You don't need to, to be organized anymore. You can watch anything you want anytime you want it. True. That's very true. Um, okay, so not only are you an actor... You're a director, you're a producer, and you're a writer, which that is the career I am working towards is all four of those things, not just um, putting myself in the acting world. But I wanted to know if you knew you always wanted to do everything or if it started with acting and like something happened where you're like, ooh, I want to also do that. It did. I mean, I think for a lot of people, it starts with acting because you feel, I think it's the most forward facing uh, role in, in storytelling, creative visual storytelling. So then it's sort of the first thing that comes to mind, like, oh, I think, you know, I want to be a part of this in general. And that seems like fun. Um, so that's really the way in. And yeah, I caught the acting bug really young. There weren't a lot of other options for me. I sort of always knew that this was the path that I wanted to take. Um, but it, when I look back, there were a lot of signs early on that I also wanted to direct and that I, I just, I thought about storytelling in a different way from just being an actor. Um, like when I was yeah. young, I used to love putting little videos together with my friends and I was literally the director and I would edit it all together afterwards. And, you know, and I loved, I loved that. I loved sort of having the story within me and then, you know, enlisting all of my friends and their talents and, and what they like to do and, and putting it all together. I really liked that process. So, and then writing has also always really been a part of who I am either, you know, I've always kept a journal or I've always, you know, I used to write for the stage. So um, it's always sort of been there as well. And now yeah, I mean, producing, I have produced, I would, I, I would be, I would be reticent to call myself a producer. I, I don't think it's my greatest <laughs> set, but sometimes you have to do it and that's fine. But there are far more yeah, I've tried producers it. out there. Yeah, I've tried it and it was one of the most intense things I've ever done. And I'm like, never again. I'm like, that was so much work. Oh, yeah. yeah. But I mean, you're producing your podcast. <laughs> That's true. That's true. But a movie and finding everyone to be in it and like finding where all the money is going to be. Cause for a short film, when you know, it's you who wrote it, who's going to direct it and producing it, you're like finding everything for it. And it all weighs on your shoulders. Right. So if something goes wrong, it's your fault kind of thing. So it's <laughs> the few times I've done it, I'm like, Oh my God, it works out in the end, but it's scary during the, during that process of doing it. Yeah. 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 I, mean, I it, it takes a very specific kind of person to really excel and love producing. Like I know some sensational producers who uh, they were just they I feel like they were put on this earth to produce films. They just love it so much and they're so good at it. So bless them. Yeah. Um okay, so I want to talk about taking it back to when your acting career first started, which is where I'm at right now. I want to know that first callback that you got when you, the first time you found out you booked a job and what that was like on set for you. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, that was my first, I mean, my first, my first time on a set was for this show that used to film uh, here in Vancouver called the untold stories of the real er and oh i love it yeah <laughs> every vancouver actor over the age of like 28 mm -hmm. was on that show and it was probably their first gig it was like everyone did that show it did not okay. pay very well it it was it was just sort of like entry level stuff but but mind you i mean 
people loved that show who like who liked it. So uh, bless them. Me? Yeah, I grew up watching it. Just you so did. You know. Oh my god. Oh Lord. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Even even the uh, even the um untold like the the sex one like untold stories of like sex stories I don't know that brought people to the ER I was all over all of that oh yeah so funny. yeah so I I, I, I you I, know I don't even remember what my role was um but I do know that I got to work with um Richard Harmon who's a fantastic uh sort of like legendary director so mm -hmm. that was great so I had a great first onset director experience he was lovely yeah I was super nervous. I mean, I was just so I came from stage. So I worked professionally in the theater for quite a while. And I, I became a, a bit of a bigger fish in the theater, at least locally. Mm -hmm. um, and I really felt like I knew what I was doing in that arena. I felt confident with my work. I knew exactly what was expected of me. And I, I felt like I could rise to the occasion. But then with film, it, it, it I had a really hard time for a while figuring out how to translate my performance onto camera. So I think I was really nervous at first. I probably overprepared. <laughs> I probably went in there and did everything exactly how I prepared, which, you know, now that I'm, I'm years and years beyond that, I know my approach is very, very yeah. different. <clears throat> but, um, but it was yeah. very exciting. It was, it was I, I still remember driving all the way out to Riverview Hospital to film and just feeling so excited and feeling like I'd worked so hard to get to this point. Mm -hmm. I'm in Poco, so Riverview is, you know, five minutes away from me. And every time I drive past it to head to Vancouver, I'm like, ooh, is anything filming? And a lot of the times there is something filming. But I want to take it one little step back because you said Richard Harmon. And in college, uh, for acting, I went to a college called Story Institute. Toby teaches there. Um, everyone knew me to be a huge Richard Harmon fan. And so I just I have to know what it was like working with him. Oh my goodness. Okay, wait, but my first question is like what what of his work are you so obsessed with? The hundred. Yeah. Which you were on which we're talking about later on. So Okay, yeah. Yeah. Oh, Richard is a really lovely man. I've gotten to work with him a number of times. He was also his daughter, Jessica, directed me in an MOW a couple of mm -hmm. years ago. And he played my dad. So I got to hang out on set with he and Cindy, his wife. Yeah. So you're talking about Richard the dad, not Richard the son. Oh, yeah. I'm talking about Richard the dad. <laughs> okay. Okay. I, you see why I was confused why you would say you were obsessed with his work. <laughs> yes. I definitely understand. Oh, my okay. God. Okay. Richard the dad. But I, I love the Harmons as a whole. I, uh, this is all my fault. Because I screwed up. Rich, okay, so Richard Harmon. I'm about to work with Richard Harmon on something. Alan Harmon is his father. And that's why my brain went immediately to Richard. Because I just saw him on Friday. Okay. We've cleaned it up. Alan is the director. Richard is the actor. Yeah, you love Richard. Um, I hear he's lovely. Hey, if you ever want to be like, I know a girl who does a podcast who would love to have you on. And I reached out to his reps, but I've heard nothing back. So I did, I did what I could. Well, Casey yeah. that is, yes, the Harmon family in general. Family. Family is great people. Yeah, so I've heard, and I that's my dream is to work with them. That's my, my first step of a dream is to work with them. Um, okay, so you just mentioned a lot about theater and how you used to um, do theater. I'm curious about um, something that you miss about theater that um, TV and film doesn't do. Oh, that's such a great question. Oh my gosh, there's so much. Mm. <clears throat> I love the work that I do in film and television and it's very different. Um, and I'm learning and I find it challenging in all of these wonderful ways. But right? gosh, do I ever miss the stage. I miss... I miss the athleticism of theater. I love, I loved being in the rehearsal hall for six weeks, if you were lucky, six weeks. Um, right. And just really drilling down into the material and taking a lot of chances 
in the discovery of what the role is going to be. I just love that longer process that you usually get in theater. I love the language of theater. You yeah. Know, I, there's some, obviously there's is, is, tremendous writing in film and TV. That, that's no question. There's just as good writing in film and TV. And I'm slowly working up to a place where I'm getting to work with better material. Um, but there's just, you know, I got to do some, some of the best plays ever. And that writing is just, mm -hmm. it's such a gift to be able to, to, to say those words and to bring those characters to life. Mm -hmm. And I love the audience. Like I, I, I miss just, there is, there is no other, there's no better feeling than knowing an audience is with you, knowing that you've got them in the palm of your hand and knowing that with a look or a quick line, you're going to, you know, bring them to tears or, uh, rip them to shreds you know it, it's just there's some there's the, that kinetic magic that happens in a theater that you don't get with film and tv as much you know the, the highs and lows are still there with film and tv the same as theater but yeah i do i miss i miss the theater so much i i want to say that i'll do it again someday I, I feel like i'm not done with it well someday i'll go back it definitely you're not done with it. see the passion just right away. Um, you said a little earlier that you've written a bit for um, theater. Uh, did you write for theater first and then go to TV and film? And is it harder one or the other? Um, I don't know that one is harder than the other. Um, I started in theater. I started writing theater when I was getting my degree um, at Bishop's years and years ago. Um, and then I wrote more when I was at, uh, when I moved out here and went to a conservatory called Studio 58. And then I had one of my plays produced and I, uh, yeah. And then it's just very different. Uh, I think theater writing and film and television writing, again, just like the performance aspect of it, it it's so different. And, uh, Film writing is quite a bit more technical. There are, are a lot more technicalities. You sort of have to learn the system of film and TV writing. And then, of course, you can break break out and, and, and make something your own. Whereas I do feel like in theater, there it's more of a blank slate. You can really create a world from the ground up. Um, and the form itself is a lot looser than what you can do with it. So they're just very different. Mm -hmm. Um, with film writing, do you use the Blake Schneider 15 beats or do you just do your own thing? Like, I know you just said you got to know the rules to break the rules, but I'm wondering at the point that you're at now, if you break those rules. I think the Blake Schneider system is really great. Um, I've definitely used it in the past. Um, it's not always what I go to. It's not necessarily something, but I, I, I think it's, smart to cross this check it whenever you're outlining a story. I'm a big believer in outlining. Um, mm -hmm. or at least for my own projects, I need to outline. I like to know exactly how I'm building to something. Um, yeah, ahead of time. So, so it is useful. Um, but there's, there are a lot of different approaches out there. Yeah. Cause we learned about the Blake Schneider one in school and as we were learning it I took what I did but at the same time I was like you know I don't agree with everything like for my personal mind and how I work and so I'm looking at my wall I'm going to try and show you as best as I can here uh, don't mind the messy room do you see the the poster like the post-its on my yeah. wall that's a movie that I'm in the process of writing and so my mom's like, do you really have to have it decorated on your wall? And I'm like, for my brain, yes, I need to like see it and how it will play out. Yeah. Um, I love writing. Yeah. And I think it's something that I definitely want to do more of. And I have a lot of ideas that I write down on like my notes. Do you do notes and stuff too? Or do you just start writing as soon as you have an idea? Oh, gosh, no. Um, I make a lot of notes. I have a running, I have running notes in my phone. I have notebooks. Um, quickly, if I decide, I have three projects right now that I'm working on pretty consistently. And I can't really go beyond that. Some people are really great and disciplined and they can focus on one thing at a time. 
I like, mm -hmm. I sort of need to have a couple of things cooking at the same time. So I, you know, writing is way more than acting. Writing is the thing that tortures me. <laughs> writing is the thing that I love. I love it so much. And it, it's really tough. I've had to face a lot more self-doubt with writing than I have had to with acting. I would say. So kudos to you for having your post-its up on your wall. Thanks, mom. No thanks. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, yeah, I think, I think that's great. And I think if it's something that you love, the, the biggest piece of advice I would give to any writer, to any young writer, um, is just figure out how to make it consistent for yourself. Figure out, mm -hmm. make it a habit that you do, you know, four or five days a week or every single day, because that's the <laughs> hardest thing about writing is that so many people become people who talk about writing. I was this for a long time and they don't write. There are so mm -hmm. many people like that. And it's, it's tough because I see, I was one of them and it hurt me. Like it caused me physical anguish that I wasn't putting pen to paper. But yeah. There are so many factors, you know, time available prioritization you know as a director actor writer i have three careers that i'm trying to foster at the same time and mm. <laughs> you know yeah. it, it, sometimes so sometimes it has to be more of an acting month and sometimes it has to be more of a, a directing month and you know it's, it's an mm. ever process yeah. Oh, and not only are you what you just mentioned, but I don't know if you still do or you've done it in the past, but coaching, coaching, acting, right? Yeah. And yeah. Um, I think someone, someone, pardon, I just came from coaching someone. There you go. So that's another thing that you do. <laughs> um, do you learn when you're coaching? Do you learn um, or do you find that you learn more about acting or writing or directing as you're coaching people? I think all, I think doing all of the things helps the other aspects of, of mm -hmm. creating story and telling story. And um, yeah, absolutely. Oh, I mean, when I started writing, my acting career uh, grew so quickly. Mm. And it was just, I, and I think that that's for a number of different reasons. I think that, as I said before, I talked about writing for so long. And then mm -hmm. when I finally did it, and I finally felt like I had this um, creative outlet that I really believed in, and I was doing it, and it, I was making it real for myself, there was a confidence that came with that and an ease towards my acting because it sort of suddenly felt like, okay, my whole creative career isn't just going to be depending on other people asking me to work in their projects, you know, mm. taking the reins into my own hands. So it affects it that way. But, but to your question, yes, your question. when I'm coaching, it, it's always, you know, it's all about dissecting the material and, and digging in and I think that as actors, it's important for us to do things like stay in class because we're constantly learning through all the diagnosis, right? Like we're absorbing as other people um, do the work, you know, we're absorbing the learning as well. So I feel really lucky that coaching has been part of my life because I love it. It's, I learn mm -hmm. much and it's incredibly rewarding to see th these actors I work with find these moments and and book work and you know mm -hmm. see their their confidence growing is just such a such a wonderful thing yeah I agree 100% in learning even when it's not being told to you because I'm just thinking back to like my audition classes or even the scene study that we that's what Toby taught um, and other people would go up and do their scene and you know when their scene would be done and they would get notes from the teachers, you would always have those people talking to each other, um, distracted or focused in on their own scene and learning it better. Whereas I was just like, I want to hear their notes because their notes could apply to me. And even if it doesn't apply to me, the director in me wants to hear the notes. And so I just, I agree 100% and, and you learn from more than just what is specifically being told to you. And uh, it's just, oh, I love this industry that we're in so much. And I also agree in going to classes and 
keeping up with that because I mean, it's like riding a bike. If you stop, you don't forget, but you become bad again. And so you want to keep practicing because I'm not trying to get bad. I just spent all my money on school. I'm trying to keep the, the no, it's true. I mean, if I, if I don't have an audition for, for even just two weeks, sometimes I, uh, and then I get a big one. It's, you know, I'm a little rusty. I, I, I always try, even if I typically this, these days I don't go a week without an, one audition or two, but um, if I do, I try and find something else to do. I try and work on some material and also coaching is, is great because it just keeps my head in the game. Yeah. I reached out to a bunch of schools this weekend to in the tri city being like, Hey, if you guys are needing any teachers, I'll, help um because during the summer I taught a couple acting camps and I mean it was with kids and I personally don't like kids but because I was doing acting with them I didn't care I was like oh but we're all acting we're like playing improv games and doing what I love so it was fun and I'm like I want to continue that but I'm very strict with myself because you know everyone's like well you're not getting paid because they don't see me going to work they don't see me getting jobs and I feel like people not in our industry it's hard for them to understand how things work and um so they're like go get a job like get a part-time job and I'm like I know I should probably for financially like for my financial purposes I'm like but I don't want to distract myself so I'm like if I am going to get some sort of a job it's going to be one within the industry even if it's being a, a reader for auditions like I don't want to get off this path because then I'll be distracted and who knows what will happen then. So yeah, I just, uh, I want to stick, stick with it. Cause that's for me, at least how I, I feel I'll go places if I stay on this road. Did you have part-time jobs? Like, did you work outside of the industry? Oh, I mean, yeah, when I first finished school years ago, I worked in the service industry for many years. And, and that was really, really hard. I, I really, I was a terrible server. <laughs> I, you know, I got the job done. Customers loved me. Um, they, I, you know, I was funny and I, I like to have fun with them. But I just, I didn't care if they were having a nice evening or anything like that. I couldn't, I couldn't bring myself to, to, to care. And I don't think that's the right attitude. I think that if I could go back and talk to myself back then, I would have tried to talk some sense into me. But I mm -hmm. think that for myself, I was just, I think I was similar to you. I just felt like all the time that I was, these are the hours of my life. I used to say to my mom and I would call her distraught over my service industry job. I would say, I feel like I am like draining the hours of my life for nothing. In mm -hmm. And this is time. I'm like, these are my good, these are my good years, mom. Like I felt like it was just sucking my soul. So it wasn't a good place for me. I do know people who managed to stay in the service industry um, for, for, for years and have a healthy relationship with it. But I try to tell all of my younger actor clients, mm -hmm. do something else. Like, like get, even if it's not, even if you can't do something that's specifically within our industry as your side hustle, because I also don't believe in suffering for your art. I think that you need to put money on the table, money on the table, food on the table. <laughs> um, you need yeah. to be able to pay your bills. <laughs> you, need, you know, yeah, like at, being an actor comes with so many, um, so many aspects of it that are already <laughs> unsure. Don't <laughs> let yourself also worry about money. You know, it's like right. make sure you can make sure you can earn your living. I tell a lot of students like go out. As soon as you're done acting school or whatever, go online and learn an online skill if you have to. Like, learn how to Pinterest manage. Learn how to write Facebook ads if you have to. Because there's a lot of money to be had as an mm -hmm. online person. And, and you set your own hours and you take on as many clients as well. You know what I mean? It's completely in your yeah. control. I just think the stress level with that is so much lower and the demand is so much more manageable than having to be at a location away from your home for eight hours a day. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. I, I hear what you're saying though. It's hard. It's hard to accept shifting your focus, but I would say always make sure that you are comfortable financially. 
Well, I am because thankfully um, I still live with my mom. I don't have to pay any bills. Um, I just like whatever things I want, that's what I pay for. So I'm at a, I'm lucky and I'm at a point where I'm not financially stressed and I don't have that burden on me um, because my mom takes care of me. Um, but I want to get to the point where she doesn't have to, but also at the same time, we're Italian too. So my mom's like, hey, it's here as long as you want. And I'm like, well, I know. <laughs> oh gosh, if only we all had Italian mothers. Right? Oh, they're the well, best. Yes, that's, that's lovely, and bless your mom for doing that. Yeah. So, I will. I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll take advantage of that until I get my life together. For sure. Um, so, the thing with acting, too, that um, I think a lot of people first don't realize, like actors ourselves, is how vulnerable the job is. Because you have to be okay with being silly, with being goofy, with going outside of your own comfort zone, of then getting into somebody else's mind, essentially. And so it can be really vulnerable. And I kind of still struggle with that. And personally, not even as an actor, just personally. And that's something I'm trying to get better at for my job and for myself really um did you ever struggle with the vulnerability or were you someone who's just like I can be goofy and not care what people think um yeah goofiness was a bit tough for me um but other kinds of vulnerability were really easy for me um you know I it was really easy for me to go to darker places. Don't really know why. Uh, you know, I, I haven't had a ton of trauma in my life, but it's just, it was just an area that I felt, it's probably going back to my angsty teenagehood. I really <laughs> identified with my sort of internal suffering. So it was always easy for me to bring that to the surface and use it in my work. Um, it, but I mean, when you say silliness and goofiness, like, I guess I, I, I have taken myself too seriously at times in my life for sure mm -hmm. and that was a little bit harder for me to break out of and but you know what sometimes you're just not a certain kind of performer and that's okay too you know some people will have their strengths and and then places that they they just don't feel like a natural um fit so i but i will say this as i've gotten older and as i've become a more balanced, happier person. Um, I have a great partner, you know, my, my life, I have a nice apartment. As I said before, I have the world's greatest cat. Right, um, yeah. As as all of those kinds of things have fallen into place and, you know, I just, I came out of my 20s, I, I, I settled down a lot more. Um, it became, I think I became goofier. Like, I think I just became more comfortable with myself. Um, so I think that sometimes when we pull away from goofiness, it's because we don't want to be seen a certain way. Um, mm. But I think that it's important to remember that, you know, laughter and smiling and, and goofiness often is met with a positive reception. And, you know, I think it's good to push yourself outside of the comfort zone to, uh, find the places, find, find ways that you can let go a little bit more. Yeah, I agree. Cause you like, again, it's not even just about the acting and the work. It's like also about personal life. Like everyone my age is going clubbing. Right. And I'm like, that scene terrifies me. I'm like dancing in front of a whole bunch of random strangers and I'm like what about my cup what if someone and I'm like I'm five feet tall someone could snatch me <laughs> and so I, I'm so here that I but also it just doesn't excite me either so I'm not like oh I wish I could go clubbing but everyone's like Alexia like come on why don't you go and I'm like ah it's just not my thing and a part of it you know is um, not wanting to be vulnerable and putting myself in uncomfortable positions 
Um, and clubbing is fine. I don't need to go. But I also want to insert myself in a few other safe but uncomfortable positions to just grow as a human being. Mm -hmm. So, and I don't think, I don't think I would even have these thoughts if I wasn't an actor because acting is so mental. And if I didn't know half of the things I know, I wouldn't have been like, oh, I need to be more of a vulnerable person and live outside of the box. I'd be like, I'm content with where I'm at. And so, hey, I love acting for bringing that out too, because it's true. It's it's a scary but great thing. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, most actors should have a therapist of some kind at different points in their life. You know, we are one of the few professions where your emotional truth and your internal truth is a part of your work. It's wild. Mm -hmm. you know? And you can, mm -hmm. you, this, this body we have, this voice, our, our internal emotional mapping, that's, that's what we use to earn a living. And that's, yeah, that has certain like disadvantages, but also a lot of advantages because we oftentimes, I love actors. Like I love, I think that they are the greatest people. Um, they're a little, they're all a little crazy, but that's also what I love because I'm a little crazy. So, you know, they're my people. They're just my people. And I find like, I love the curiosity that comes with being an actor. And I, so I think that it's, it's important that we have really strong mental hygiene um, mm -hmm. make sure that we're safe in the work and in our lives because it's easy for those wires to get crossed. It really is. You know, you see a lot of actors. That's why I'm really grateful for my training in the theater because when I, the theater school that I went to, um, talked all the time about being able to use yourself in the work in a way that was healthy and in a way that allowed you to let it go at the end of the day and leave it all in the theater or you know on set and go home and be a normal person um yeah 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 um so talking about everything we just said kind of proves how acting is not an easy job and how it's actually extremely difficult um not only do people think that acting is easy and that everyone can do it but lots of people also think that it's a form of lying possibly I'm wondering um, what other misconceptions you've heard about acting, and can you debunk them? <laughs> I'll debunk the last one that you said, the, uh, the the lying thing. I know I hate that. Because right? oh, people think they're being so clever, and they come up to you, and they're like, so what do you do? And you're like, I'm an actor. And it's like, oh, so you lie for a living? And you're like, mm -hmm. the... The magic of acting, or I would say that the challenge of acting is that we're actually not lying. And a, a good actor is always telling the truth all, all the time. And it's, that's what makes it hard. That's what makes it, because, and that's the mental gymnastics that we have to do. The mental and emotional mm -hmm. gymnastics. Our, our work is to literally tether our bodies and minds onto someone else's lived experience and then tell the truth from that perspective. And it's, hard ass work <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so that is my that's that one what are other myths yeah i mean i guess that we're all divas i don't like that True. one you know yeah. i have worked with actors and actresses who don't at face value have the best attitude and i can tell you 100 percent of the time it's because of their insecurities mm. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and I have yeah. so much empathy for that so because I do have been a very insecure person and continue to be, you know, given a, the right situation can definitely make me feel like I want to go back into my turtle shell. And right. I, yeah. So I think, I think that there's work to be done to, for actors to always to just, especially female actors with each other to just always support each other and, 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 you know, debunk our own ideas and our own myths about the fact that we're all like there's only room for one of us at the top and that we're in competition with each other it's it's so mm -hmm. boring, that perspective and it's so old school and dumb but i understand why it's there because women have been pitted against you and continue to always be pitted against each other in, in media and social 
steps. Yeah. But, um, yeah. So I try, you know, the high, the idea that actors are all divas is just such bull. Um, mm -hmm. um, I'm sure there are others. Probably that we don't do anything all day. The idea that we just like sit around and wait for an audition. You can be that kind of actor if you want to be. I have mm -hmm. been before, and that's be why I became a writer and director because I thought, my right. God, <laughs> I can't. I just yeah, I tried it. That's why this podcast exists because I was like, I can't just sit here and bite my fingers all day waiting for this these emails to come in. I'm like, I have to be creative somehow. Yeah. So yeah, this started for me. Yeah, Thank good for you. Thank you. Um, okay, let's take it back to the hundred. So it's my favorite show of all time. Oh. And the reason I am acting and went to school because of Lindsay Morgan, who you got to work with on the episode she directed, season seven, episode seven. I got to know everything. Oh my god. Oh, what can I tell you about that? Uh, that was a wonderful experience. Lindsay was, was uh, so cool. Even in my very first audition, oh no, I suppose I met her at the callback. Um, her vibe, her energy was so welcoming, so passionate, so open. Um, I could tell I really liked her. And then she, she cast me and she told me right in the room that she, that she liked my work. And that doesn't happen with a lot of, I love actor directors. I, lo I love this movement that's happening and I'm, I'm glad to be a part of it because I do think that it's so useful for directors to understand exactly where we come from and, and the kind of work that we do. And, and the fact that 90% of our career is spent on spec work, you know, auditioning. And, um, yeah, so. Which you don't get paid for. Which you don't get paid for. Um, so, yeah, and then, I don't know what else to say. The 100 at that point in my career, I guess it wasn't the biggest set I'd been on yet, but it certainly is a very big awesome cool set huge set pieces um i got to be in um that lab area or something with the big yeah. okay i will tell you that big ball thing the big ah. do you know what it was called <laughs> I, I can't remember right now but it was the thing that you transport from planets on with yeah the, it was just made of like <laughs> foam so it was very light. So if you even just yeah. brushed it, it would move. And so there oh, was wow. a lot of trouble. We were constantly holding until it would stop moving. And we, we wasted <laughs> a bit of a time that way. Um, but it was great. Lindsay crushed it. She brought a great energy to set. Loved working with her. Um, I remember that she wanted, she was very specific about the the look of, on my face that she wanted when I walk out and I see um, the other cast members who have arrived on the ship. And yeah. our inspiration for that, she wanted me to to say that I was walking out. It was like it was a Beyonce that I was seeing. Mm -hmm. And I remember I was still, God, that was, what, four four years ago, I think. And, and I, it's been a while now. It's been a while. And I was still sort of in a phase where I was like, less is more, Stephanie. Less is more. Less is more. And I think I was just, I overtook my own note. And I think I was, just, she was like, okay, now come out and you see Beyonce. And my face would like barely move <laughs> and she was like okay okay one more time one more time good work one more time she was very generous with me but I think we had to do it like three times and then finally I was like okay I, I think I should just relax and take her note to a larger mm -hmm. um but yeah it was great and then I had to come back for some reshoots and it was a wonderful experience well that was Lindsay's first time directing too so you got to experience her first ever time as a director, which is monumental. So congratulations. Oh, well, she did such a great job. Um, yeah, the last uh, podcast that I did is actually called How Ariana Grande and Lindsay, Mo Lindsay Morgan Saved My Life. Because those two, Ariana and Lindsay, they, um, they really did, like, in the lowest times of my life. They were the ones who got me out of it. Not family, not friends. It was them. And so I always say, like, to give Lindsay and Ariana a hug would be would just mean so much to me. And so yeah, as soon as I 
right? As soon as I found out that you worked with Lindsay, I was like, oh my God, I have to ask everything I got to know. So I was, I was really excited to know that you not only work with Lindsay, but the Harmons too. I'm like, oh my gosh, you're working with everyone I love. <laughs> love it. Um, okay, let's- well, Vancouver's kind of a small town, so if you kind of work with everybody pretty quickly. Yeah, I uh, had an audition a while ago, and the director was Alan. That's his name, right? We just went over yeah, that. You figured it out. It's out. Please, yeah. God, I hope, he, I hope he doesn't listen to this and know that I forgot his name. I hope he does listen to this. I hope he does listen to for your sake, for your sake. Right? Yeah. Um, and so I saw that it was him, and I was like, oh, my gosh, I have an audition for one of the Harmons. And it was like, that was a very exciting moment for me personally. Um, oh, I before we get into the game, I have, I liked this question. What's been most rewarding for you? Is it watching what you've acted in or watching what you've written and directed? Or is it, like, equal? Okay, so full disclosure. Um, mm -hmm. I love working in film and TV. I'm very proud of some of my performances, but I'm still working. I have yet to have the kind of roles on camera that I got to have in theater, which were really needy, really, really challenging, um, really made me work hard. Um, so I'm still working towards that. Um, but I, the experience of writing and directing, um, my last film, especially, uh, it's tough to put words to it. I was so, so damn proud. Um, and that was consumer, right? That's consumer. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I, I feel like there's almost no, no contest there, but you know, talk to me in a couple of years and I'm sure my, my answer will change maybe, but, um, yeah. I find that, you know, I love acting because it's my, it's my craft, right? Like it's the craft that I've dedicated my life to. And I love it mm -hmm. so much. Because I, I believe in the service of actors. I believe in the service of storytelling and I believe in the service of allowing the viewing audience to experience their own growth and their own empathy expand through watching, uh, through watching us bring these stories to life. Like I really, as I think it sounds so hokey and nerdy to a lot of actors, but I really, really believe in that. And it's the reason yeah. I, I continue to pursue it. Um, you know, despite the fact that maybe I'm not exactly playing the roles yet that I want to be playing, I believe that I will someday. And I, I have in the past. Yeah. So, but writing and directing allows me to directly share my perspective. With you. My perspective with you. In acting, I get to write. I, I get to bring my own life experience and, and, and my own storytelling abilities with my body and my voice and, and, you know, my emotional life. But with film, with writing and directing, it's what, what I really have to say as a person and as a creative, I get to say. So it's, it's just a different thing. Oh, I love that for you. I just, I love seeing the passion come off people because I'm the same way. Um, but speaking about, speaking about the acting that you have done, this game is you finishing the lines of the characters that you played in the past. Oh my God. I don't know. If it's, um, but it's straight off your demo. So, so, uh, the first one of course is the hundred. Um, and your line looks like Nick, Cara, we, Dr. We need some something in here. Yeah, we need some disciples. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Disciples. Yes. Yeah. Great. Um, okay, the flash. The flash. Good night, Hawkshaw. Tell Gwen. Thanks for the brownies. <laughs> yes. Look at you go. Snatched from mommy. Oh my gosh. Your character oh gosh. from Snatch for Mommy. Can she really use that excuse though? Julia's. Julia's been Julia. uh, something uh, since the day you introduced us. Uh huh. You used the word earlier in this to describe um, how people might think actors to be. Been a diva since the day you introduced us. 
<laughs> yes. Okay, this one you did not act in, but it's a part of consumer, so you wrote. Okay. And it's for Rain's okay. character. Uh, she has 112,000 followers. I have like. I have like 30, and I'm related to most of them. So. Yes. Actually, before I go to the next one, um, I asked Toby for the script, the full script, because I hadn't read it. Um, this was after shooting and stuff, and I was like, well, I want to know what happened. And so I got to read the script, and then I had an audition class, so I actually took that scene, and I brought it to audition class, and I just wrote it to be a little longer, and then I did, I did it, and I was like, oh, that was pretty good. Yeah. So, okay. Um, okay. This is also consumer, the last one, but it's the doll. Okay. Anxiety is. Anxiety is. Anxiety is the best diet. There you go. I haven't even watched consumer yet. I wanted to. Me and my. A uh, friend, we were going to go to the premiere that Crazy Eights had. And then the weekend came up and we were like, oh, shit, it's today. And so, oh, no. so we didn't end up going. Oh, no. um, but I'm, I am I know it was on that website, too, but you had to, like, pay for it. So I didn't watch it. But one day I'll, I'll get to watching it. One day you'll um, be definitely going to screen in Vancouver at some point at a couple of festivals. So, yeah. Right. Yeah, I'm like, I want to watch that one part of me taking off my shirt. I'm like, I want to see how, how much of me I can see in there. <laughs> um, before we conclude, you post a lot about animal laws, animal cruelty, a lot about um, animals in Vancouver, the rights. Um, how can people, where can people learn more, become more educated about this topic because it's so important. Oh, thank you for bringing this up. It is something that's extremely, extremely important to me and I, I think should be an important to all of us because the implications of um, animal welfare uh, on our society are not just, you know, it's not just about the fact that there are thousands of creatures suffering um, at our hands. It's, you know, there are, are in, intense in, environmental implications. Um, biosecurity implications, you know, the, we were successful in uh, getting a moratorium on mink farms in BC, largely because BC mink farms were contracting COVID-19 and mutating COVID-19. So, you know, it's a reality, the way that we exploit uh, animals in our societies is, is really going to lead to worse and worse situations, um, you know, in the future. So, um People can follow Animal Justice. I think Animal Justice is a fantastic resource, especially if you're Canadian. But if anywhere in the world, um, they're a Canadian law association that work to, uh, you know, um, they lobby uh, governments to, to pass more uh, policies. And they also work to defend animal rights activists who are being prosecuted for their work. Um, so uh, Animal Justice is great. Um, I think people, if they can afford it, uh, contribute to the Excelsior 4 Defense Fund. Um, that's a group of activists who were recently convicted of ridiculous charges um, for a protest that was leveled against a hog farm, Excelsior hog farm, um, in uh, Abbotsford, BC. Um, and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, there are a lot of different resources. I, I encourage people to get involved in their local BC or legal, local SBCAs, or, um, you know, if you're in the States, um, you know, donate to your local shelter. Um, if you're at the grocery store and you see a couple of cans of cat food, pick it up, drop it off at a shelter, you know, any, any little bit helps. Um, but if you really want to get involved, I would say, um, check out Animal Justice. Um, every year they have an incredible program called the Animal Justice Academy, and it's six weeks and you really learn top detail. That was a terrible metaphor to use in this situation, but you really, hear, you really learn from beginning to end. Um, all aspects of uh, advocating for uh, animals in our society. Yeah, it's so important because they can't advocate for themselves. Like, we have to be the ones doing it for them uh, because they don't have the voice, right? And and it's 
tough too because there's just so many people unfortunately who don't care about animals um and it's so sad and heartbreaking to see as someone who is a huge animal lover um and so I thank you for being someone who posts about it who talks about it sheds light on the awfulness that people do to animals because it's just so sad and so important to talk about it breaks my heart because they can't fight for themselves. They can, but we we can and we do, you know. And I think it's it's it can be really heartbreaking being an animal advocate because, as you said, there are a lot of people who just they they're not willing to um, accept the reality of the situation. They're just not willing to because we we make a lot of money off of animal exploitation and. Um, it's a lot more comfortable for people to continue to numb out their ability to empathize with suffering, you know, of something of a different species. It's, it's just easier to do that. Um, but I do think that people do feel it somewhere they're deep inside themselves. And so it, it, it's, yeah, anyway, I could go, I could go on and on and on, but I won't take up all of the podcast with this, but yeah, <laughs> thank, you, thank you for asking the question. I really appreciate any opportunity I get to talk about it. Yeah. Oh, of course. Of course. It's so important. And I'm the same way about animals, feminism, mental health, all of that. It's stuff we need to never stop talking about because there's so much to be learned and taught. So yes, but it kind of feels weird because there's a question that I wrote down that I want to go back to, um, but it's not about animals, but we're going to do it. We're going to, because we have a little bit of time. I'm using every minute here. Um, if you could play any character that you've written, doesn't matter age, doesn't matter look, what character would you love to play that you've written? Uh, well, I'm, I'm going to play a character that I've written next year um, in another show. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. So there's that it's going to be a, a short sci-fi psychological story. Love. Um, that's my favorite. <laughs> and you know, I, the character of Rain was really, really dug from my own experiences when I was a teenager. So in some ways, I feel like I've already played that part. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's from consumer for the people listening. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Okay. Uh. Oh, okay, so um, if you could watch a show, a movie, or read a book for the first time again, what would that be? Or all three. What was I just saying to someone? Oh, I was just saying to somebody the other day that I'm so excited for them because they hadn't watched something and I've already watched it. I mean, there's, mm -hmm. there's lots of things. I love Hereditary is one of my all-time favorite movies. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. so I'd love to watch that anew. Um, I've just been thinking, um, that there's a book that I read last year around this time by Audrey Neffenegger, um, called Her Terrible Symmetry, I think is the name of it. And I loved it so much. And I wish I'm thinking about reading it again, just because it's a little Halloween-y and it's, you know, we're getting into spooky mm. season. So I think about that. Um, I don't know. It's a really good question. I feel like I don't have great answers for it. Though. No, that's great. It's kind of hard to think on the spot. Um, for me, I have no idea what movie. Oh, I guess it would be the first Escape Room, the 2019 version, because that blew my mind. Um, watching it, I'm a huge tour fan, too, and I just think the way they killed off characters was some of the best killings, murders that I've ever seen on TV. And so I love it. And then another book called Unraveling Isabel, who the author I'm actually talking to on next Monday for the podcast too. So I'm really excited for that. Oh, and that God. book I could read again. Yeah. So I'm excited. Um, okay. Uh, what are your social medias? Where can people find you? And all of that. Sell yourself. I guess. <laughs> Um, yeah, you can follow me on Twitter. I'm mostly just, no, sorry. I take that back. Not Twitter. You can follow me on Instagram. I don't really tweet. Um, I do have an account I'm on there 
maybe six, every six months I retweet one thing, but it's not really my, my zone. Um, I'd love if people follow me on Instagram. Um, and it's just my name at Stephanie Isaac, um, I Z S A K. And my website is just stephanieisaac.com. It's sort of half under construction right now, but I do post updates on there, about different projects that I'm working on. And then of course there's my IMDB, which is just search my name and I'll pop up. Awesome. So it seems like everything is just your name, which makes it really easy my name's to Penny. find you. <laughs> awesome. Um, well, that's an hour. So thank you so much for coming on. I had so much fun. I can talk about the film industry forever. So I appreciate you coming on and taking time to talk about it on I Don't Care. Oh, Alexia, this was so much fun. Um, this is so great. I love to see you and your passion coming out in this. Um, and thank Aww. you so much for having me.